Well, uh, I don't know if you've ever taken time to evaluate yourself. Uh, that's a good thing to do once in a while. Find out where you are spiritually. Uh, I remember, I remember one time I, I picked up a hitchhiker and he got in the car and I said, uh, "Where are you going?" He said, "Wherever you're going." <laughs> I said, "How are you doing?" He said, "He said I'm doing the best I can." And I thought to myself, if you were doing the best you can, you wouldn't be hitchhiking on the road. <laughs> Uh, but once in a while, you know, I, I, you know, preachers particularly have to analyze themselves. Uh, you, you don't want to, you don't want to have to have your congregation <laughs> analyzing you, because because that that might awfully be discouraging. But anyhow. Uh, uh, over the past uh, few days, I guess, uh, it's been an up and down situation at our house. Uh, we uh, uh, we got one insurance already has denied our claim, and uh, now they're going after another insurance policy, and so uh, our house is in shambles. Uh, so don't come and visit us because <laughs> it's a wreck. Uh, we're just we're just existing. That's all there. So so we're looking forward to, to better days. And I trust you're looking forward to better days too. I was thinking this morning, how many of you are at least a little afraid of our government? Let me see your hand. My stars. Yeah. Everybody. Well, I'm I'm a little afraid too. Uh, uh, probably they're just one vote away from from Congress uh, and the president taxing the church. Now that will devastate. Churches like us absolutely devastate us. And churches by the thousands will close their doors if they have to pay taxes on their buildings, their property, and their vehicles, and whatever. But there's one vote away, that's all. Just one vote away from that happening. They've been They've been talking about it for a long time. And uh, probably after November, what is the date of the election? The 8th. The 8th? The well, somewhere in through there. The first, first Tuesday, I believe it is, or the second Tuesday, anyhow. Uh, if they're going to do anything mean and rotten to Christianity, they're going to do it probably before that particular time. So, so be be ever be ever prayerful about what's happening over the next three four weeks, because it's going to be very uh, uh, telling as to what direction our country is going. So keep that in mind. Now. I want you to take your Bible, please, and turn to uh, Matthew chapter uh, 9. Matthew chapter 9. Uh, uh, if you got the Huff Hand Report, and some of you get it, some of you don't, but you notice that the title of my message is, is, uh, is uh, uh, Farmers... Start your engines. <laughs> well, you know, it's a takeoff on the Indy 500 when the guy says to the race drivers, gentlemen, start your engines. Well, uh, 
in a sense, you know, this is, this is harvest time. This is, this is the time of the year that uh, the farmers live and breathe for. They work hard during the winter, keeping or getting all of their equipment in shape, sharpening everything, uh, repairing anything that's broken. They work hard. Uh, now, given the fact that it's a whole lot more convenient, uh, they are able to uh, farm thousands of acres, thousands. Up in my church in Tipton, I had five full-time farmers in my church, uh, and one gentleman farmer, he had 80 acres that he just farmed out to somebody else, but, but he was a gentleman farmer. And they're all gone now, except for one. Uh, that's Phil Overdorf. And uh, his daughter came, you remember, and did some singing for us with that group. Those are, those are mostly his children or grandchildren. And so, uh, but even though he's getting up in years now, he still gets on the combine uh, or, or the tractor and makes his way through the fields and does a little work. Uh, but, but his son probably does most of the work now. Uh, and I don't know how many thousands of acres they farm, but the unique thing about their operation is they also have a half a million chickens. Half a million. I'll tell you, that's a lot of eggs. <laughs> and it's a lot of legs. <laughs> yes, it is. So, anyhow, uh, the farmers today, uh, they still work hard. They really work hard. And they're the salt of the earth. They're the ones that keeps the country fed. And it's important that we always remember the farmers in prayer. And so, and so as we look forward to, to uh, harvest time, uh, I'm particularly interested in the spiritual harvest. See, we need to, uh, we need to gear up and get ourselves ready for the spiritual harvest. And that's what our text is all about this morning. It, it's actually in chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. It says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearts. Let's pray together. Father, uh, this is your day. This is your word. And the field, that belongs to you too. And there's there's many, many, many people to be harvested. And so, Father, I pray that our hearts might be overwhelmed with the responsibility that we have as a congregation and as a pastor to do what we can to reap some of the harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. When I, when I look at this passage, I'm reminded of what somebody must have spoken, and I wrote it down in my Bible. 
For instance, in verse uh, 35, we need to serve like Jesus served. That seems to ring true. We need to serve like Jesus served. Secondly, we see this in verse 36. We need to see what Jesus saw. He saw the multitude and was moved with compassion. And then finally, finally we need to submit to what Jesus said. In verse 35, or verse 38, he said, Therefore, therefore pray ye the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I don't know if you realize, I'm sure some of you do, that uh, the colleges and seminaries are not producing many servants anymore. Uh, preachers don't seem to uh, do any direction as to their young men about going off to Bible college and studying for the ministry. I don't know how many preachers walk away. I've heard all kinds of numbers. But I know that tons of preachers are walking away from the ministry today out of frustration, out of uh, discouragement, uh, out of enormous stress. I was thinking this morning about my friend Rory. Rory took over a very, very, very large church without ever pastoring a church before. I remember when we started out, I, I pastored a little church that we started out in Freeport, Illinois. And I, I, got, my, I got my feet wet. I got uh, some experience. I learned how to deal with people. And I learned how to study the Bible and then preach. I, I learned a lot of things in that small church. But Rory, Rory stepped into a monster situation. And I'm confident that the stress has been very difficult for him. But stress and discouragement and depression is a curse to the ministry. And every pastor that I know has gone through some kind of... Uh, emotional stress of some kind, uh, causing great difficulty for himself and his family. And so we need, to, we need to pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. That's just a side note because of that's what was written in my Bible. But this morning... As I look at, particularly in, as I look at verse 36, I'm reminded of a passage in, uh, in John chapter 4. That's the passage about the woman in the well. In John chapter 4, Jesus said to his disciples, I must needs go through Samaria. Now why in the world well, would, Jerry, would, would, would Jesus want to go through Samaria? Nobody went through Samaria. Those people down there didn't like Jews. They hated them. They couldn't get along with the Jews, and the Jews couldn't, along with, couldn't get along with the Samaritans. That's the reason the Good Samaritan story is such a miraculous thing. They didn't like each other. And yet Jesus said, I must, I must needs go through Samaria. So why? Well, because there was a lady down there that needed to get saved. It was the lady of the night. And, 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 and she needed to get saved and become a missionary. 
and, and lead all of her gentlemen friends out to Jesus, where they too came to know Christ as their Savior. And I believe, I believe established a footing for Philip. Remember in the book of Acts, in Philip uh, went over to Samaria and had a great revival meeting. And I believe it all started with, with Jesus having to go through Samaria. He was, they were, of course, on their way up to Jerusalem for the Passover. But they had to go through Samaria because there was a lady that needed to get saved. But there's another Another reason, too, there was a lesson that the disciples needed to learn. That lesson is a lesson that you and I need to learn. Jesus said to his disciples, Say not ye, there is yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they're white already to harvest. The harvest is, a, is an amazing thing. I go all around uh, Hamilton County and Tipton County and Howard County, and I see the thousands upon thousands of acres of corn and beans yet to be harvested. But by the end of October, all of it is harvested. And, and it never ceases to amaze me how they get it all in. And it's because the farmers have started their engine. They've gotten onto the, the harvest uh, machines and got the job done. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, there's, there's an enormous harvest of souls out there who have never one time, one time, ever had a clear presentation of the gospel. And that's the responsibility of the church. It isn't, just, it isn't just my job. It's the responsibility of the church. And that's what this text is all about this morning. Because, because the first thing I see here is that the harvest is everywhere. Everywhere. Jesus went everywhere preaching the gospel. Uh, he, he went into the, the temple. He went into the synagogues. He went out into the cities and the towns and the villages. Uh, he, he, went, he, he ate with the publicans and the sinners. Uh, he, he went over to Tyre and Sidon. That's Gentile country. It didn't matter to Jesus what race they were. It was, uh, uh, you know, red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight. And so, and so he went everywhere. Everywhere preaching the gospel. And I'm afraid, folk. I'm afraid that, that, that uh, uh, the church is falling and failing in its responsibility. We think that, that they ought to come and, 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 and into the church house. We, we have this idea that, that that if people want to get saved, let them come to the church house and get saved. That's not God's formula. That's never been God's formula. God's formula is for the church to go out and reap the harvest and then bring them in. That's the formula of the Bible. Uh, you see, you see, uh, uh, we think that it's sufficient to come and sit uh, when God says you've got to go and tell. That's the, that's the ministry and the message that God would give to every one of us this morning. And sometimes, sometimes we've got to be a little creative if we want to uh, witness, if, if we want to get the gospel out, if we want to uh, get the good news. We have to be creative. A few days ago, my wife and I were 
at a local restaurant. And a lady came to our table with an arm full of pictures of Jesus. It was the Solomon's head of Christ. It's probably the most popular of all of the pictures of Jesus. And she wanted to know if we would like to purchase a picture of Jesus. And I thought to myself afterwards, that was her way of witnessing. That was her way of, 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 of confronting us with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got to be creative. I, I like what Matthew did, Aaron. You know what Matthew did? When he got saved, mind you, he was a crooked tax collector. Some things never change. But he was a crooked tax collector. And so, so when he got saved, I mean really genuinely saved, he decided to, to make a great feast. And then he inv invited all of his uh, crooked tax collecting buddies to come and enjoy a free meal. Everybody likes free. And so they came probably by the hundreds and came in, but I have an idea that he preached to them first. That, by the way, that's, they do, that's what they do at the rescue mission. Uh, I worked at the Mel Trotter Rescue Mission one summer uh, as an intern, and uh, it was up at Grand Rapids, Michigan at the Mel Trotter Rescue Mission. And, uh, and, and of course, the doors, the doors were open at uh, about 6.30, and uh, people started to coming in. I mean, the place would be filled, uh, uh, probably an auditorium of this size, and every seat would be filled with, with uh, transit people uh, uh, wanting to get a meal. But before they could get a meal, they got, some, they got the ministry of the Word. They, they, they were fed the Word. Uh, but, but I have an idea, that's what Matthew did. And then once he got the gospel out to them, uh, they, they sat down at the table and had a free meal. You know, that, that's being creative, David. That's being creative. And, and if we want to uh, share the gospel with people, we probably have to start being a little creative in, 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 in accomplishing that. But, but, the, but the harvest... Folk, the harvest is everywhere. But there's something else about the harvest that I want to share with you. And that is the harvest is abundant. The harvest is, is just incredible. We look around. We, we look around and see all the farm acres and the beans and the corn. And we say, boy, it's really a bumper crop this year. Yeah, and it is. It's a bumper crop. I mean, they got the weather just when they needed it. They got the rain just when they needed it. And now it is just a wonderful crop. And now they're going to harvest it. But, 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 but here's, here's the important thing about, about this spiritual harvest. It's abundant. Jesus said, notice, he said in verse 37, the harvest truly is what? What? Plenteous. It's out there. I mean, there's tons of people out there that need to get saved. And, and believe me, folks, believe me now, they're not coming in here to hear how bad they are. Now, we have to go out there and let them know how good God is. See? That's the difference. Uh... Uh, they, they, Jesus saw the harvest, and, 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 and in verse 36, it says, when he saw the multitude, the multitude, I, I'm, I'm reminded uh, how the first church got started. When Peter uh, preached at the, on the day of Pentecost, uh, 3,000 people came to know Christ as their Savior. And then, and then, 
after that, after that, you keep reading in the book of Acts, and you'll notice that they stopped counting and went to the word multitude. Multitudes. Now, how did that happen? I'll tell you how it happened. It wasn't the disciples. It was that 3,000 who became instant missionaries as they gave their testimony to their friends. Thousands and thousands of people came, came to know Christ as their Savior. Multitudes. <coughs> Multitudes were getting saved. And folk, listen, that's the ministry of the church. It's to reach out to the multitudes. That's what, that's what Jesus is telling us here. There's, there's a lot of people out there, people for whom Jesus died. And if they don't hear the gospel, I don't know if you realize this, but we're quickly, we're quickly approaching Eight billion people in the world. Let that sink in for a moment. You know how many people in America? I think it's right around 360 million. Did you know that China has a billion and a half people? India, right next door, has another billion and a half people. Two, two nations with three billion people, most of which are going to die and go to hell because nobody has given them the gospel. Nobody. The harvest is plenteous. There's lots of people out there, folk, that have never heard. I, I like what the Tennessee volunteer uh, did. Now, this particular Tennessee volunteer, when he joined up to the Confederacy, he, he, he wasn't much for marching and all of that regimental stuff. He wasn't much for that. But he, he was a squirrel hunter. I mean, he had this rifle, and he could he could shoot the eye out of a rabbit at at, at fifty paces. And so, so while some of the other people were lollygagging in the camp, he decided to go out into the woods and see if he could find some Yankees. And so, after a while, he found some, and he marched them up to the camp. And they said, where in the world did you find all these Yankees? He said, the woods is full of them. And I thought, you know, that's true of people who need to get saved. The woods is full of them. I mean, I mean, uh, there's, there's, there's not many of us here today, but there's lots of them out there who have never had a clear presentation of the gospel. Oh, they know who Jesus is. They know, I mean, they can talk about God even in a slang. Uh, they, they, in fact, they may even be religious, but they've never had a clear presentation of the gospel. I remember reading about Hyman Appleman, the great citywide evangelist who, by the way, led Billy Graham to Christ. Hyman Appleman, in a great citywide campaign, said he doubted. He doubted if half of the church members were ever saved. Wow. I, I think that's even worse today. It's it's probably it's probably less today that's saved. So so folk, listen. Now I'm, I want you to know that the woods is full of them. There's lots of people out there. The the harvest is plenteous. But there's a third thought. 
and that is the harvest is waiting. They're waiting. Now, in that passage over in John chapter 4 that I quoted a little while ago concerning the harvest, I want you to understand something. Uh, God readies the harvest. You see, most people, including saved people, are not so conscious. I mean, when you see a group of people at, at Walmart or, or someplace, do you ever think in your mind, I wonder if they're saved? I wonder if they've ever heard the gospel of Christ. Are you so conscious? And, and, and most people, most people out in the streets, lost people are not so conscious. They're conscious of how they look. They're, they're conscious of, of, uh, of what people think about them. Uh, they're conscious of, uh, of many things, but, but they're not conscious about their soul. And God knows who will respond to the gospel. I don't know. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the harvest is hidden. I, I mean, it's like a treasure hid in the field. We don't know where they are. But, but God has readied them. And, 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 and folk, listen, the readiness of the harvest, the, the readiness of the harvest has got to be matched by the readiness of the harvester. You ever notice that farmers never take a vacation in October? <laughs> I mean, I mean, they don't go visiting their kids out west or out east in October. They, I mean, they don't even want to get sick in October because that's harvest time. And, and they got to be about the harvest business. And the church, ladies and gentlemen, our church, and any churches that might be listening, has got to get serious about the harvest. We got to start being soul conscious. See, we think the church is a place where we come and visit with our friends, find out what the latest news or gossip is. We think the church is a place where, where we can uh, just uh, get together and, and fellowship. That's not the main thing. Years ago, I had Dr. Mike Patterson come and preach a conference for me. He was the director of the Abiram Mission out of Fort Worth, Texas. And I'll never forget what he said. He said the church has, has somehow gotten off track. Let me say that again. Somehow, he said, the church has gotten off track. It focuses on multiple things, but they've forgotten about the main thing. The main thing. So, What's the main thing? The main thing, ladies and gentlemen, is, is getting people saved. The main thing is, is reaching the lost for Christ. Whether it's in, 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 in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria or the uttermost parts of the earth. The main thing is getting folks saved. Getting them baptized. Getting them to join the church. That's the main thing. And once we get the main thing in our hearts, we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. Preachers 
tend to get discouraged. We were talking about that at the dinner table on Friday. We give invitations. And, 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 and we'll continue to give invitations. Because there might be somebody, one person, maybe maybe two people or whatever, there may be somebody in the congregation that, that has slipped in unaware. And they were lost. And so we give them the gospel. Let them know that God loves them. Jesus died for them. And we invite them to come and accept Christ as their Savior. And although, although in most invitations hardly anybody ever comes, we still, we still give the invitation for that one who might come to know Jesus. Because you never know who it might be. I remember reading the life story of Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers. I had a 19-year-old boy. He was out one Sunday evening, uh, discouraged, didn't know where he was going to land and didn't know anything about his life. It was just a mess. And he he, he was out walking and he passed by this building where he heard some singing. And he stopped to listen. Stopped to listen. And, and then he went over to the building and slipped inside and, sta and sat in the back. And after the singing was over, the preacher got up. And according to Spurgeon, he wasn't very good. But he preached a message on look and live. Look and live. And Spurgeon, 19 years old, looked and kept looking and then got saved. In a little Methodist church, in a little country town, you see, we, we never know. We never know who's in the congregation that, that, that needs to, 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 be, to, re be, to be reaped, to be harvested. And so we extend the invitation to everybody. And that one person might come. Discouragement is one of the most difficult things in the ministry. As I said before, it's the curse of the ministry. And I remember, and by the way, I've sat there, David. I'm sure you have too. And uh, I remember one time I was sitting in my study contemplating quitting. I hate, I hate that. I hate the idea of quitting, quitting anything unless it's quit smoking or quit drinking or quit cussing or quit doing mean, rotten, despicable things. Those things we need to quit, but we can't quit the ministry. We can't quit preaching. We can't quit doing right. But I was, I was seriously thinking about quitting the ministry. And the telephone rang. And... Uh, lady on the other end was a member of the church and she said, Pastor, uh, would my, my father is out in the hospital and he's dying, won't, won't probably last the night, and he's lost. Would you go out and talk to him? Now, nobody told me that he was a drunkard. No one told me that he was an alcoholic. No, n no one told me that that dozens of preachers have tried to get him saved. Nobody. I went out as innocent as, a, as anybody. And I stepped into the room, and the people were all gathered around in the room, uh, you know, as, as family does, and waiting for the man to die. And, and I said, I said, so-and-so has asked me to come and talk to this gentleman about his soul. 
So if it would be all right with you, I'd like to have you slip out into the hall. And so, so they, 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 they went out into the hallway, and, 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 and so I was there by myself with him, and I said, Sir, I said, they tell me that you're going to die sometime yet today, maybe in the night. And as I understand it, you're lost, and you're going to die and go to hell. I said, is that what you want to do? I mean, I was really tough. I said, is that, I mean, you, you really want to go to hell and suffer torment in the flames of fire? No. No. I said, well, do you mind if I show you from the Bible how you can be saved? And he said, yeah. And so I, I took him to Romans 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I said, that means that you're a sinner. I said, you acknowledge that? Oh, he said, yeah. I, then I took him to Romans 6.23, and I said, now we got some good news and some bad news here. I'm going to give you the bad news first. I said, the wages of sin is death. That separation from God. I said, because you're a hell-bound sinner, you'll be forever separated from God. But I said, the good news is that, 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 that uh, God wants to give you eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I said, would you like to have that? He said, yes. I then took him to John 1.12. But to as many as received Christ, to them gave he the power or the authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I said, would you like to receive Christ into your heart today? He said, yes, I would. I... Uh, I took him over to Revelation 3.20. That's one of my favorite verses, David. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. I said, Sir, if you want to receive Christ as your Savior, you've got to invite him in. He, won't, he, he, he will not come into your life unless you invite him. I said, would you be willing to do that right now? He said, yes. And so I helped him with a prayer. And I said to him, I, I, I had a hold of his hand, I'll never forget. Uh, and I said, now, now, if you really meant that in your heart, I want you to squeeze my hand. He almost broke my hand. In his death-dying moments, he almost broke my hand. He squeezed it so hard. And so, and so I went out and got the family in. I said, I said, sir, I said, uh, these people want to know what you just did. And he said to them, I just got saved. And some of them, some of them couldn't care less, but some of them rejoiced including myself. I thought, you know, if there's one thing that, that encourages you more than anything else is winning somebody to Jesus, leading someone to Christ. And folk, that's what, that's what the church is all about. It's not about visiting your friends. It, it, it's not seeing what we wear. The church, folk, the, the church isn't, isn't a worship center. It's a boot camp where we learn how to shoot the gospel gun, we get, our, get our prepared for the battlefield. That's what the church is all about. It's not a recreation room. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Bible institute to, to teach people how to... Well, how to uh, uh, 
care for the dying and, and, and win the lost to Jesus. That's what it's all about. And I would hope, I would hope every one of you today could take the Bible, open it up, and show somebody how to get saved. Because that's what the church is all about. Uh, over in, over in the Psalm 137, uh, we find the children of Israel in bondage because of their disobedience, and they're and and and, and, and they've all gathered around the, the one of the. Two rivers, either the Euphrates or the Tigris River, there in Babylon, and and uh, and they're moaning and groaning about their 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 captivity, and 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 in Jeremiah eight twenty, Jeremiah eight twenty, it says it says uh, there in, in that passage the the, har- the this, he said uh, he said the, the harvest is past, the summer's ended. We're not saved. Now, the word saved there means rescued. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And nobody has come to rescue us. You see, the kings went forth to battle during the summer. That's the only time they, had a, they could do it. Because, because their, their entire army was agricultural. And so during the summertime, which was a leaning, leaning time for the, for the people, and so during that time, the, the king was able to get his army together and go forth to battle. But, 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 but the harvest was past. The summer was ended. And, and these people, lollygagging there at the river, could never be saved. They could never be rescued. And so what did they do? Well, they hung their harps upon the willows. And then when the Babylonians came along and said, listen, we would love to hear one of your songs of Zion. They said, we can't sing the Lord's song in a strange land. Pray tell. If you can't sing it in a strange land, where can you sing it? See, folk, listen, the world is strange to us. And we have a song to sing. We have a message to tell. We need to, we need to take our, our harps off the willow trees and start singing the songs of Zion. The harvest is everywhere. The harvest is bountiful, but the harvest is waiting because the laborers are few. God bless you as we take the Lord's table this morning. And once again, I might add, if you're a saved person, you know the Lord. We want you to take the Lord's table. You're, you're free to do that. So keep that in mind. Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice to know that you're in charge. Nothing ever takes you by surprise. And so we trust God that you'll minister to our hearts now as we partake of the Lord's table. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to take your Bible, please, and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, there, you know, it, it's one of the, the most precious uh, chapters because it, it tells us about the Lord's table. Now, uh, in, in Matthew 26, uh, it's recognized as the Passover. And of course, uh, the Passover then became part of the Lord's table. And so, so now Paul is expressing his thoughts from the Holy Spirit as to relating to the, to the Lord's table. 
And so let me, let, let me read. It says in verse 23 of chapter 11, For I have 